All right. Let's give some time for the people to join. For participants to log in. All right. All right, so let's get started. Hi, hello, everybody. This is Javi. And uh, uh, as, as, as uh, I, I would like to start this, this, uh, this second session of Log Life uh, by doing an introduction of, of me, of my role, and, and, and what, the, what the purpose of this, of this uh, online talk is about, right? So uh, as I said, my name is Javi. I'm Spanish. You can, I cannot hide this accent. Like, uh, it's been like this since I started speaking English. Uh, I've been living out of Spain for uh, 12 years. I am, a, I am a lawyer. I have a law degree. I have a master's in international business. And as many of you that are watching today, I landed in the localization industry per complete chance, right? Uh, my title, I work for the organization Aclaro, of course, and, uh, and my title is the Global Brand Champion. And, uh, and, and, and you're wondering what this title is, right? Well, as a millennial, I created a title, as a sales role, but it's a title that uh, that includes three main guidelines one is connecting caring and inspiring others that's why this role exists that's why we're doing this and that's why i started this this series right it's super funny i have been called uh, uh, i've been i've been in the industry for five years and and, and as i said most of you know me i have been called social butterfly social icon it's super funny i thank you all for those for those things right and uh, so now, um, uh, as I said, I'm going to start. The, we're going to kickstart the, the second the second session of Lock Life. And uh, and, uh, and and I want to tell you guys why uh, I wanted to create uh, the space of Lock Life. Right? Since the pandemic started, uh, um, most of the most of the of the of the I mean, there's been a lot of initiatives on going on about doing webinars, etc. There's been a lot of 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 of, of companies that have started theirs. But I, when I start, when I when I started Lock Life, uh, I said I, I I did it with a purpose, thinking that there's a, there's a part of ours of, our, of the human relationships that are not touched upon when we are uh, when 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 we talk online, right? So uh, the main purpose is to show definitely the human side of of the localization industry, right? Uh, because I truly believe that we are more than just uh, vendor buyers, competitors, providers, and, and super big brands. We are people here that have strong relationships, people that uh, have connections, and I wanted to do this space for, for, for to, 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 to talk about that, right? So uh, as I said, this is the second part, this is the second edition of Lock Life, and uh, I, I can't but say thank you to everyone here. The response has been amazing. We have had almost 250 people registering for this particular panel that we have named uh, um, and uh, private work, LGBTQ plus perspectives. Uh, so uh, stay with us for this hour. Uh, uh, we have a, an amazing panel with leaders from our industry. And uh, one of the things that, that, that I wanted to, I want to let you guys know from the very beginning, I want to let you folks know from the very beginning is that we have surprises. We have surprises for our panelists. Uh, since the response was big and a lot of people wanted to participate with us, I said, okay, let's invite more folks. We're gonna have that guest, those guest speakers, but I'm gonna have as well uh, many, uh, many uh, guest speakers, friends that are going to be tuning in and asking questions. All right. So uh, I want to start with this uh, clarifying what look like this. I want to give thanks to my friends, to my family, to all of you that are watching here. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time to see this amazing panel. So uh, can we please go to slide two? So. I want to explain uh, 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 that today's session is going to be recorded, and uh, and uh, and uh, we are, I mean we we welcome you all to participate because we we want to make this very interactive. We want to do poll questions. We are going to ask you as well to throw your 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 questions there so we can answer them at the end. And if you want to communicate, please use the event hashtag uh, hashtag play event right. So, without further ado. I'd like to introduce the panelists. So, Fabi, Patrick, Emma, uh, please turn, 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 turn your, other Patrick, turn your cameras on. Introduce yourself. Say hi to everybody here watching. 
Should so we start by, like I have, I have on my left upper let it, let side. Let first. Of, yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's, it's precisely Emma appearing there. So Emma, would you like the introduction of yourself? Hello. Yes, of course. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Emma. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks, Javi, for, for thinking of me and inviting me in this, in this panel. Um, I currently work at Booking.com. My background is in translations and interpreting, so I, I didn't stamp in, in this meeting like some, some, some of you. I actually started in the localization industry, uh, sort of. Um, I started at Booking as a Catalan language specialist, so I know a little bit about localization myself. Um, and now I lead the team, the Catalan team and the Spanish team at Booking.com, based in Barcelona. Thank you. Patrick Chu, would you like to introduce yourself, my friend? Hello there. Uh, like Emma said, thank you, Aclara and Javi, for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, my name is Patrick Chu. I work for change.org as the language guy, uh, as internationalization and language services manager. I'm based out of San Francisco, the, whose ancestral lands are the Ohlone tribe. And thanks to them, I'm here. I am a cis male, gay, pronouns he, him, they, there, and or if you prefer Han or Kai, depending on which language you speak. All right. Fabiano Cid, you're next. <clears throat> yeah, I think I'm the only representative from the vendor side. I'm Fabiano, uh, born and raised in Brazil, currently here, but soon moving to Montreal, where my company is headquarters, headquartered. Um, so yes, I'm the Chief Operations Officer for OXO Innovation, and I am a male, cis, gay man. <laughs> I get confused with these, these denominations, but that's it. Nice, nice, nice. Patrick Nunes, my friend from Chicago, can you introduce yeah. yourself? Absolutely. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Patrick Nunes, originally uh, from Brazil, actually born and raised as well, uh, but uh, work as the Director of Global Communications and Design at the World Headquarters for Rotary International, right outside of Chicago. Um, and yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a great panel. Uh, also, male, cis, gay men. <laughs> okay. Terence, last but not least, of course, you, my friend. Sure, uh, and Javi, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Terence Michaels. Um, I oversee the translation and localization program at Starbucks. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I identify as a cis gay male. Uh, uh, he, him, his are my pronouns. Um, and looking forward to chatting a little bit about LGBTQIA world at Starbucks. Um, Nice. Thank you, guys. This is a pleasure for me that you guys are all here. It's, 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 it's a real honor. So I can just my thank, my thank you all, right? And uh, uh, so let's, let's start with the questions because what we have for the, for the audience and for you guys is going to be a, a, a friendly talk. We're all at home. We have invited all these audience. We have over 100 people connected. That's so nice. Thank you, guys. Uh, to our homes, to talk between friends, to have a nice friendly chat, right? And, uh, and uh, I, we, would you like to share the first, uh, the first slide with the, with the first question? Because uh, we want to touch upon the topic of inclusivity in our industry and the visibility of the LGBTQIA plus community, right? And, uh, and um, you know, guys, and, 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 and it's been pretty difficult to create a, a, a diverse panel that truly really represents this community uh, in the localization industry. Why do you guys think that that's, that's, that's the reason? Do you think our industry is really diverse? Uh, the visibility of the, and, and how is the visibility of this community? Uh, Fabiano, would you like to give your, your thoughts on this? Sure, sure. Um, I may recall the, the rehearsal session that we had. Um, I don't know whether it's the lack of opportunity for people to you know, show their identity or present their identity. But when we were having our call, I knew that we we're all representatives of the community, but we just assumed, you know, I saw these four guys, we just assumed they were all cis gay male. They could be transgender uh, men and we didn't know. And I don't know, I haven't had contact with uh, more than one 
transgender person in this industry that was a translator in Brazil. We actually tried to hire her, but she went for a competitor. Uh, but it's, I don't know whether people are not showing their true identity or we're not being, we haven't been able to welcome them into, into our community. I know that transgender people usually have, you know, a harder time to find a, a job, but maybe it's, it's, it's time that we start thinking how we can attract these people and make it, uh, the industry more attractive to them. Since we're so open to cultures and races, we should be open to, to gender identities and gender uh, um, in general. Yes. What, what do you think that could be, Patrick, too? Well, so the story I tell myself is that, you know, there's, in general, in the lock industry, there's a wider breadth of tolerance and inclusion uh, just because, you know, there's just so many, there's a broad variety of backgrounds, cultures, and languages that come into everything. Uh, but I think that the primary focus tends to be on uh, overt sort of like features, <clears throat> such as, you know, linguistic, cultural, or, you know, national types of features, rather than a covert feature such as being a member of the LGBTQAI plus community. Mm -hmm. um, as, you know, an LGBTQAI plus member, you know, you kind of realize if you're in a sort of more accepting environment or territory, you know, it can be a walk in the park. No worries. You can be out and everything else, but much of the world is not like that. So you possibly would tend to sort of be keeping that sort of like in a little bit more because you're walking on eggshells with an elephant potentially in the room and potentially, <laughs> depending on where you're at, you could have negative repercussions on your physical well-being. Um, I think that because the localization industry itself is relatively open, um, I think people without any overt assurances, like, you know, safe spaces, ambassadors, or externally visible affirmations, people are going to sort of err on the side of being a little bit more cautious rather than being out. So I think at least for my, my few experiences, this has been sort of the case where it's like, you just don't necessarily have it all out there. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. Emma, would you like to comment on this as well? Do you have a point to share yeah. with us? Yeah, I, I agree with them, actually. Um, yeah, when, when I first was introduced to this panel, uh, what I saw was for what I assumed to be for gay men. And I thought, oh, and there's no woman. And that's why I decided to, that uh, there, there needed to be some kind of a woman representation in, in the panel, right? But I, I think that, that we, um, we are a vivid representation of what goes on in, in real life in a way and what goes on even within our community where transgender people, just to name transgender, but also bisexual and other, um, other types are misrepresented even within our industry. And this panel is just like a representation of, of what happens out there as well. Yeah, yeah I think, I think you're, you guys have given a very, very good opinion, yeah. So now I wanna, I wanna move to the next question. If anyone else, you guys wanna, like folks wanna comment, uh, Patrick or oh, Patrick Nunes, you guys are right. So here's where the round of surprises for our panelists starts because uh, as I explained in the very beginning, we're gonna have guest speakers who are going to be connecting every few minutes and they're going to be directing this panel. And I wanna invite uh, for to, to uh, right now to, to turn his camera on uh, Mr. Arn Schlim. Arn Schlim is, uh, hey, <laughs> he's the uncle that I never had. He was my boss for two years. He's one of the best friends I have in this world. I love him so much. I saw him last time in London in February. I took him to a musical uh, there as well. Like it was my, 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 my present for him after, seeing, after having seen him for five years, for five months, sorry. <laughs> and now I said he has to be here. And he, Aaron, is a, is, is, is a very close friend of mine. He has introduced me to Patrick uh, Chu and to Terence Michael. So I needed him to be here. I needed him to be, participate here. Aaron, introduce yourself. Send us a question. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, great to see you all there. Patrick, um, Terence, great to see both of you. It's been a long time. Um, just a quick anecdote, the, the musical that Javi took me to see was Book of Mormon, so I thought that was kind of an appropriate detail. Um, 
But yeah, um, I'm, I, the question that I have for you is, it has a little bit of overlap, I think, with what you've already been saying. Um, but, you know, the question I have is this. Essentially, in our community, it's really easy to be self-congratulatory, particularly if you're a cis, white, gay man, right? Um, we, and there's, it's legitimate to be, to celebrate the fact that, you know, much has changed and much is better, but also it's very easy to overlook those who are being overlooked. Um, and so I guess my question for you is, how does the intersectionality of race and gender and queerness, broadly speaking, play out in your experience in the industry? Um, and more specifically, so that, that's a big question. Um, and then more, more specifically, what do you make of the relative invisibility of trans people in our community? Um, and I know you already touched on that a bit, um, but I would love to hear you guys elaborate on those various different kinds of intersectionality and how we can be, we can celebrate what we've, what has been achieved while also not forgetting those who are easily um, overlooked. Emma, would you like to reply to that, for example? Yeah, um, it's a great question. So thanks for asking that. Um, so I, I believe in the localization industry, but just in general, like in, in any industry, we still have a long way to go in terms of diversity and inclusivity. Um, in a way, I see like a spectrum. The, the more you are towards like uh, white, straight, with resources, men, the better positioned in theory you start off in, in life, right? And, and the more like women, lesbian, black, transgender, uh, with limited resources, <laughs> Uh, the less opportunities you start with. This is in general, of course, there may be exceptions, but this is kind of like a checkbox, a checkbox that, 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 that I see, right? So in my case, the way it has played out, so I consider myself lucky because, okay, I'm a woman, which in theory makes it a bit harder than, than being a man in this particular society that we live in. Um, I'm a lesbian, but um, I'm white, and I was lucky enough to have parents uh, who had the resources to pay for, for my studies, for instance. I was born in a country where not only they don't kill me for being gay, but actually there are laws against homophobia, and I could even get married. So I consider myself privileged in a way, even though um, I think there's still, still a long way to go in terms of culture and, and general acceptance in, in society because one thing is the laws and the other thing is what happens in real life, right? Um, but I, I also think, uh, so, so when we say uh, the sentence, all, all men are created equal, uh, in practice this is not really the case. And, and to start with, the way we are phrasing the sentence, which I think it's in the Declaration of Independence of the, of the US, it, it is wrong essentially, right? Because we are saying all men. So um, um, as I said, all these factors play a big role in how you are positioned in life. And in the case of transgender people, I think they are at the bottom of of this, of all this spectrum that I was talking about. And even within our community, a gay white man uh, is going to have more visibility than a transgender black woman, for instance. And it's something that we ourselves, uh, I think we need to think about. And uh, like, like I said before, this is a vivid representation of what happens in reality. Um, so yeah, the misrepresentation of transgender people in our community is something that uh, we should take into account and, and improve for sure. Thank you, thank you. Fabi, any comments or Patrick Nunes or anyone wants to comment Patrick. on that? Patrick, go ahead. If you want to comment something, Patrick. Can you hear us, Patrick? Oh, yeah. I can hear now. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think it's it's uh, that that spectrum is very important to keep in mind, right? Because it's a reality, and and I think we are, we all have to come from the point that 
we all we all have biases right and they're all mostly unconscious right and that's even within our community there are biases that we grew up with and, and that's a product of the environment right we, we're not born with them and, and it's the environment and as emma well well pointed out we all have our privileges and i think it's important to check in with our what our privileges are uh, as our starting point there and and i think it's um as the community is open to, to, to race and, and, and gender, and there is some openness. And I think there were a few comments in, in, the, in, in the chat box that I noticed that, that are very true because we come from the outside world be, before we come into this community that we have in the, in the localization and globalization world. And, and we bring those biases with us regardless, right? We, we bring them with us. And I think it's important to, it's, a, it's an important time, I think, in history for us to check in with ourselves and expand that and, and share that with others. And this panel is actually it's a great opportunity to do just that. Um, so I think it's, uh, that spectrum has to be remembered, has to be acknowledged, and, and, and has to be paid attention to. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. That's a good, that's a good point. And, and what can our industry do to mitigate that, right, as well? Yeah? What, what, what are we doing to, 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 to do that, right? So... That's it. Anyone? Anyone? Would you like? Would you get? Would you like? Would you get, Would you like to comment any further? Aaron, your thoughts. You're always. You have always have opinions, and I would like to hear yours on this as well. Since you asked the question. No, I mean, I think your panelists have done a great job answering the question. Um, you know, I think it's the the challenge in my mind is, I think that probably everybody here would in real life encourage and support and do the right things. The question is, how do we make it, how do we create a more inviting, how do we create more inviting atmosphere? How do we create more opportunity so that people who are left out can come in? I think that's, I don't doubt any of our willingness to accept and embrace. I just wonder how we can as an industry create opportunities, like and, build something and not just accept. And I think it has to be intentional, right, Aaron? I think because a lot of times we have to acknowledge that having these conversations can be uncomfortable. And, and, and we many times choose the comfortable side of things, not to talk about things. And we have to put some into your point. The, the intentions are there uh, or the good willing is there, but we have to make it a point, a purpose to create those situations from talking about the situation, finding actions that you can take and actually implementing those actions, right? Yeah, um, if, I, if I can, if we still have time. Uh, a few yeah. years ago, we, uh, we, I was on the board of Gala and we worked with Common Sense Advisory to run this survey on um, gender, uh, gender issues in the localization industry. It's a very interesting, uh, the results are very interesting because everybody thought, even at CSA, they thought, oh, well, this is a predominantly feminine uh, industry, you know, it's predominantly women working on it. So why are we talking about gender imbalance? And I said, well, let's see, let's get the data and see whether this is true. And it was true. I mean, there is a gender imbalance. Men do reach the boardroom more easily. There are very little uh, women represented in the boardroom, even though the most successful companies are run by women uh, in this industry. Uh, the salaries are different, the opportunities are not equal. So one thing that we could do, and I know Renato is there, you could take the lead, Renato, is gather data. Data is, you know, it's paramount that we start talking about who, how many transgender people do we have represented in this industry. We just, you know, uh, someone said uh, that they're not cis, and this is the second person I, I, I've encountered during all these 25 years in this industry. Uh, but you, we need to know, we need to know how many people are there and whether, you know, how, what can we do about these numbers? How can we improve them? Thank you, Fabi. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Aaron, like, thank you very much. I miss you so much. Like, I, I hope we can travel soon and go, go meet you soon and all of you guys. So thank you everybody. This is great. Thanks for doing this. No worries. Thanks. My pleasure. So thank you guys. Like I wanna, I wanna, um, I wanna as well, uh, like move further to the next, uh, to the next question, the next topic for discussion for the panel. And now I wanna call another of of my um, good, a good friend of mine, a good friend of mine who is, uh, I, I call him an inventor because he's been really a, a strong figure in the industry. 
he's a founder, he's a founding member of, of, of MemoQ. He's now, he has founded another company called Be Lazy. So Isvan, my dear Isvan from Hungary, would you like to connect? Turn your camera on, say hi, introduce yourself. It's going to do it better. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm Isvan, and um, uh, have you already introduced me? except he didn't say that I'm also working with Renato in, in NIMSI in certain technology. So the one thing that, that uh, is like really interesting for me is that so far there has been a lot of talk about community and about public matters. And like I'm coming from a small town in Hungary and like I'm relatively a person who, who likes to keep one-on-one -on -one conversations a lot. And like one thing that, that interests me is private life. Because I've seen people who speak a lot, uh, but don't say much about their private life. And I've seen people who are completely open. So what I'm wondering is, uh, for all of you, dear panelists, like has private life ever been an issue for you at work? And uh, how much do you share at work? And this may be part of your, of your personality as much as having to do with, uh, with being part of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and also one thing that's interesting is that the only vendor side person here is, is Fabiano. Is it like much easier to, to, to open up at a large organization than it is, let's say, at a language service provider? So thank you, Isma, for the question. Before, uh, before I, uh, I, I, I'd be super happy if Terence starts by commenting this question, but before he does, I want to announce as well that one of the things that we love doing is the audience, to interact with the audience, is we like to throw poll questions and we're gonna be throwing the first poll question now. So you guys, while, while the panelists are, are, are replying and giving the points of view, you're super welcome to, to, to reply to that poll, okay? So it's there, shot, so please, Terence, you, you, you've been quiet. I want you to give your point of view <laughs> now, my man. Sure, definitely. So um, first off, I want to start by saying I'm in a very lucky position. Uh, first off, I, I'm lucky uh, in that, you know, I am a white male um, and I recognize that privilege and that makes it a little bit easier, not just for me uh, in, the, in my career path, <clears throat> but I also recognize, you know, that in terms of comfort level at work, um, I can be a bit more open than maybe others feel they can be. Um, that said, you know, that hasn't always been the case, but I'm also very lucky in my current situation. I work for a company, Starbucks, that is incredibly um, accepting uh, the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, we have a very open workforce. Um, you know, I remember the first team I was hired into when I started working at Starbucks, we, uh, it was a team of 15 people and we had one guy who we called the token straight man on the team <laughs> because everybody else was either uh, queer men or women uh, who were on that team. So it's just, and that was kind of a blessing to me because before my work at Starbucks, um, I did, worked at a company for six years. Um, it was a book publisher, and book publishing is generally thought of as a pretty liberal uh, industry, but at that company, I did not feel at all comfortable in its culture to be open with my private life. Some people knew that I was gay, um, and, but a lot of others didn't. And there was just, you know, there's that fear sometimes about how you're going to be um, recognized, and it was a small company, so how are you going to be recognized within that work environment? Are people going to actually take you serious and I had a somewhat leadership role and I was worried that uh, some of the folks in that company in the culture that was being fostered there uh, that I wouldn't have been taken serious. So I kept myself and it was a very uncomfortable situation. It's shocking that I spent six years doing that um, but as I said you know like so grateful that um, in my 11 years at Starbucks um, you know, it's just such a great comforting um, culture. Mm. Um, mm. So, yeah. Mm. So, Emma, would you like to give us your point of view, please? Yeah, like, like Terence, I think I have been very lucky in, in my life as well. I work at a big uh, corporate company where not only, like, um, we're encouraged to, to come out in a way. So you feel 
very welcomed, but it's true that before this experience, I was working at a smaller company and I was following my, my parents' advice at the time. It was when, when I started working and they were afraid that if I mentioned to my coworkers that, that I was gay, that it would jeopardize my, my career. So back then um, it was an issue for me and I spent a whole year without like saying lies or omitting information, which is kind of lying as well. And from that experience, after one year, I came out to my colleagues. It was super awkward, both for me and for my colleagues. I don't recommend that at all. Um, um, but yeah, after that experience, I decided that in a any company that I worked later on, I would, at the first opportunity that I have, it's not that I scream it, but um, I try to say it right away just to, to get it out there. Because one of the things that they don't tell you um, is that you think once I come out to my, to my parents, that's it. And that's not the case, right? We all know we have to come out like almost on a daily basis uh, throughout our lives. And yeah, it's something that you need to deal with. But I, I'm, I'm very lucky. I don't know if I had been working at a small, a uh, traditional Spanish company if, if I would have had the same experience, to be honest. Patrick Nunes, do you want to give your point of view? Yeah, for me, it was interesting because it was both, um, it was more of a mindset, my own mindset, especially coming from Brazil and being a, a much less accepting culture in my generation, when I was growing up in the 80s and the 90s, um, where you had to fit the norm, right? That's why, again, based on our my biases of what my life could be if I if I were truthful to myself and 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 before others. So for me, coming to the United States was the first step to kind of understand that there was more openness and more acceptance, um, at least at the time. Um, and and coming at Rotary, it was interesting because it was my own journey. I knew Rotary was very diverse, very accepting, uh, but it was my own struggle, my own journey to be comfortable with in my own skin. I went through that process of like, how, how was it? And, and Emma mentioned like about this whole idea of like, do you raise the flag and you scream about it? But hmm. it's, in the, it's in the little things, right? When you're talking about a personal life and if you have somebody in your life, most of the time, if you're in the closet, you hide that, right? You hide that fact that you have somebody, period, because you don't want to lie, but you're still lying as well. So, you know, and it took me a journey to be able to meet new coworkers or talk to coworkers and mention my partner and mention his hmm. name and that so it was my personal my personal acceptance i think and my personal understanding of of an environment that is accepting and diverse in general mm -hmm. patrick too you do sure have, you should have something to comment this as well uh so i'm going to sort of like uh dovetail and echo terence's statement that i feel very very lucky i live in the san francisco bay area which is overall relatively you know open and diverse and the company that i work for at change.org even since ever since I started when we were much smaller, it has already had a much deeper and pervasive over and vocal diversity built into it just because of a strong social activist sort of hmm. roots uh, to the company. So for me, it hasn't really been anything too much other than, hey, okay, don't have to worry about, you know, be keeping myself in the closet or, you know, like watching out what I say about particular things. Mm -hmm. I will, however, contrast that with uh, working at my previous job where even though it was in the Bay Area and it was a tech firm, mm -hmm. started off as a small startup and then was acquired by a large company. Um, the, the, nobody said don't be, but it was sort of understood to be professional, uh, which would potentially sort of like tone you down a little bit, but not really. Um, mm -hmm. And then even more so prior to that, I would contrast it with working in the university here in the Bay Area. And that was much more where pretty much most of the, my colleagues were very, were older than I was, much older, and they were much more conservative. And so it's like, all right, well, you know, I just won't talk about that. Uh, so I think that, you know, looking at where I'm at now, especially here in the lock industry <laughs> and at change.org, I would definitely have to say, as the years have rolled by, I'm <laughs> allowed to have more openness with my own personal life. And I've come into my own skin, like Patrick has said, and everybody else has said too. It's like, all right, I'm more comfortable about it. Um, mm -hmm. But not that many problems, I would say, now. Mm -hmm. Fabi, I give you one minute to comment your point of view, please. For me, it was easy. I mean, I was, before, before being an, uh, an employee, I'm also a partner at OXO. 
but I'm an executive there. I was a company owner, so I founded the company in 99. Uh, I was always open. Sometimes I was too open. Maybe I was trying to find the balance between being open. I remember this first employee we sat down and I was hiring him and I said, I'm gay, I, ho I hope you don't have a problem with it. And he was like, uh, yeah, no, no, I don't. <laughs> Uh, it was unnecessary, it wasn't called for, but I think I was struggling with, you know, it had only been five years and 99, uh, things weren't as, as easy as they are now, especially in Brazil, things were, you know, pretty close. So, yeah, but I've never had, I've never had any issues. It was, it was easy for me. So privilege on top of that, on, on top of being white. Uh, I also was a company owner, so I didn't have to, and my partner was gay too, so it made things much easier. Uh, not the current one, the previous one. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Fabi. I'm going to now, I'm going to say super thanks to all of you. I'm going to say super thanks to Isvan as well. Isvan, you know that you are one of my favorite people in the industry as well. And I want to, uh, I want to thank you. Like, uh, I'd like you to, 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 to say bye, to turn off your camera. And I want to share while Thank I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Anne. And uh, and uh, and I'd like to share the. I mean, my colleagues have shared the the the, the results of the poll of the first poll. So people, as you can see, are 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 open to sharing uh, uh, whether they're members or not. And uh, share some elements. Most of the people have said that they share some elements. They don't, they don't share it all. In me, in my case, I share it all. You know, <laughs> I'm super open to 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 open, to talk about everything. Fabi's laughing. He knows. He's the guy. He's the guy that gets my my, my jokes and my memes and stuff all the time. So yeah. <laughs> so thanks for that. And uh, and uh, let's get to the next question. And for that, I also want to like I'm saying like my favorite person in the, in the industry all the time. But it's true. I have gathered a group of super people that I love and friends. So I want to invite my dear friend, Hilary, to turn on her camera, introduce herself, and ask a question to the panel. Hilary Normagna. Hola. Hey, hola. I'm super <laughs> happy to be here, super excited about this panel. Um, I wanted to, well, first introductions. I'm Hilary Normagna. Um, I've worked buyer side, vendor side, lived in Brazil and the US. Um, I currently work for ASICS and I manage the localizations of their fitness apps, which is a super fun space to be in. Um, echoing back to something we were discussing earlier on how we can be more inclusive as someone who has built a team. Um, and I know many of you guys also have your own teams and that you have hired. I wanted to ask, um, what measures have you taken to build an inclusive network of candidates? And do you have any advice for those of us who are also hiring managers and building out our own teams? Thank you. Patrick Nunes, would you like to comment on that one? Sure, yes. Um, well, at Rotary International, um, we have an amazing, a phenomenal team of uh, our people and talent team uh, who oversees all the all our human uh, resources and our hiring processes, and and they have been implementing great measures uh, corporate wide uh, to to help with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So from from training to hiring managers in terms of unconscious bias to you know to to techniques to to implement you know job postings in certain websites that focus on minorities and i think if i if i were to share some some tips and thoughts about that what people can do i would say one of the things that is very important and especially because diversity equity inclusion is so out there right now, right? We've been, we're talking so much about that. I think one of the first steps that people can take is actually assess their diversity. What's their diversity? Because I think sometimes you can, you can make a mistake by trying too much. So I assess your diversity, what's missing? Right, and, and pick one or two maybe to start with, to try to focus on, because sometimes people try to say, okay, now we're gonna be super diverse and we're gonna go in all directions. And that can, that can, be, that can backfire very easily because you might, you might lose track of, of what really is important. So assess the diversity overall, not just in terms of gender and identity, but all, all the spectrum of diversity. And mm -hmm. if I'm thinking of the hiring process itself, uh, sometimes it, it, it 
it starts from the from the beginning, right? The sourcing. So I would say check your how you're wording your your job post, right? Your job description. Are there words there that can you know put off good candidates because they are you know there sometimes you use words and because we live in the society that are very masculine focused, right? Some words and and there are studies that show that that can you know you know drive away good candidates or women, for example, or others. Um, Check your images. And you know, sometimes, you know, people say, well, we are diverse. They have that big, beautiful disclosure in the job post. But then when the candidate goes to their website and, and there's no diversity represented, right? So are you really diverse? It's good to talk mm -hmm. about that. It's great to, to put that declaration that you are, but are you really? Um, mm -hmm. And maybe you can create, you know, referral systems in, in minority groups within your organization. You can create a referral system that if minority groups have a referral and they can get something. So there, there are different techniques that can be applied. Um, and as hiring managers, I think one of the most important things, and there are studies as well that, that, that support that, is in the screening process, right? Many times in the screening process, because our, our conscious bias is with us constantly, many times we end up making decisions in the screening process or the interview process based on that bias. So many companies now have, you know, automated screening processes or removing names and, and schools and education to, to kind of really look at the candidates for what they can bring. Um, mm. And something as simple, and I used to do that a lot, and I stopped doing that um, because in the world that we live in, it's become common practice for candidates to offer their LinkedIn page. So I would go and check in their LinkedIn as part of my screening process. I stopped doing that because, you know, there is an image there. There's a photo. There is, there are things, there are elements there that can trigger that unconscious bias. So sometimes it's just like small things that we can do to try mm -hmm. to remove ourselves and checking with our unconscious bias. Every little thing can help in that process to, towards diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. I want to, uh, before, before I, I give the word to Patrick Chu, I'd like to announce that we're going to throw the second uh, poll question here. So for the audience and the Patrick, I'd love to hear your point of view on this. Go on. If you oh. want to, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that we're included. So I so in the Loke industry, I my my I'm relatively new, I would say, to the Loke as an industry itself. Um, but from what I have seen so far, given the sort of uh, how to say it, semi-visibility of LGBTQAI plus community members amongst uh, the whole of the people who are around. I would definitely say that, you know, you can notice when there are leaders who are and you're like, oh, my Dara has just gone off. Okay, that makes sense. That's cool. Two thumbs up. And, but it's, again, like I had prefaced earlier is that I've never really necessarily focused in on that just because of that sort of like mixed sort of audience mixed sort of community thing where it's not necessarily going to be something to be called out. I do mm -hmm. believe having seen people um, who are in positions that do have prominence, you know, seem to be representatives. And I think that it's great to see so far. That's just my sort of like mm -hmm. brief, brief intro to it all. That's probably mm -hmm. what I can say. Fabi, you have comments on this? Yeah. Uh, so, I, uh, after the, the survey that I mentioned, I was invited to be an advisory board member for the Women for Education, one of the most amazing associations in this industry. If you're not part of it, you should become a member. It's amazing. Women but in localization, you said, right? Because the, your audio women, just... Women in localization, yes. Women in localization. <laughs> um, but uh, being there, I... I, we, we started this, this committee at the, the company called the Gender Awareness Community. Committee. So it was basically about gender awareness, just male, female. And as we evolved, we now have the Equity and Diversity Committee, which is very similar to what Patrick was saying. Uh, and within it, there's going to be uh, an article about it uh, soon by Retiba, our marketing uh, person there, and we've implemented a few things. One of them is blind CVs, as uh, Patrick mentioned. We also have, so we have subcommittees. So one of the subcommittee is dealing with neutral language uh, or more inclusive language, trying mm -hmm. to come up with a, a style guide for inclusive language in all the languages that we offer, not only mm -hmm. for 
clients, but also our vendors. And the Blind TV serves for, you know, both, uh, you know, probably uh, on the client side, you don't hire freelancers, I don't know, but uh, this applies to both freelancers and employees for us. Uh, we also have a initiative to make management aware of unconscious bias. So we're getting, you know, getting some training for us all. So there are several, you know, initiatives that can be implemented to make sure that, you know, uh, the, the, your company is more inclusive and the hiring process is, mm -hmm. is aware of these issues and makes sure that it's more inclusive and diverse. I, lo I love this, this reply. Thank you. That's so cool. Uh, Hilary, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I hope one, you're one of, one of our panelists in the future. Eh? <laughs> Maybe one day. Thank you for your responses. This is awesome. All right. So um, we, thank you, Hilary. So we're going to share the results of, the, of this last poll. And uh, as you can see, uh, we have asked within the localization and globalization community, do you feel that LGBTQIA plus professionals are included, supported, and celebrated? And people are saying that mostly yes, but there's room for improvement, right? So that's the general thought. Thank you. So now I wanna I wanna get to the next question, and for that I have invited one of my French friends, Lexan, which works at Facebook. Lexan, would you like to join us? I'm here. Hi. Hello. So you have the mic. Ask us a question, please. Yes. Yes, okay, so hi, I'm Lexan, I'm the French localization editor on Facebook, I use she, her pronouns, and the question I have today is a little bit different from the other questions we asked during this panel, because it's on a more technical side, a more linguistic side, and less of an HR side. Um, in many Romance languages and in other languages, there's a default, well, there's gendered words and there's a default gender. And I'm really glad you mentioned it, Fabiano, in uh, saying that in the job offers, you try to use an inclusive spelling, inclusive language uh, when, try, when making the, the, the job offers. And uh, one thing I was wondering about is, do you have special insights on how we can create those new those new styles and those new kind well, those new standards really of expressing ourselves in an inclusive way, especially in gendered language that use male as neutral. And how can we like what should the balance be between setting a new trend or following tradition in a less inclusive way? And uh, how do we also adapt to different dialects uh, for languages that are used in several countries. For example, Fr French, uh, the French from France way of talking is not gonna be the same as in Francophone Africa, for example. So we're gonna have different standards. So how do you deal with this? And do you have any insights to share with us about this? Thank you, dear Alexandre. I'll, Emma, would you like to reply this question? Yes, sure. Uh, it's a great question, Lexan. And me being a translator myself, I, ha I have dealt with this problem before. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer or a right answer to this question, to be honest. Um, but I can share my insights with you. So basically, my teams, the Catalan team and the Spanish team, fall into this category, category of Romance languages that deal with this male gender uh, yeah, it, it, it's an issue. And the question that, that, that always comes to my mind with this is, um, so does society shape the language that we use? Or is the language that we use what shapes the societies we live in? Or do they interact with each other and feed each other, right? Um, uh, so in, in any case, it, it has be, it's true that it has become increasingly important uh, for people to feel uh, included and, and, and as in the localization industry, you need to be mindful of that when translating or localizing. Um, however, uh, for instance, I work in an e-commerce company. So, um, and the, the ultimate aim of localization in a way is naturalness, right? We want people to read our translations as if they were written in, in our own language. Uh, we want it to flow. We want the customer not to think too much so that they end up buying what we want them to buy in a way. Um, so, and of course, if for instance, in Spanish, there's this trend now of start using an X or an E for the, the, the male gender um, nouns and so on. Um, so, 
yeah, what comes to mind is will customers like this? Will customers think this is a, like a political statement that the company is doing? Will they find it weird? Will they stop them from buying? Um, but yet on the other side, you could always argue, well, if we start, if we never start doing it, we're never going to change the language we use and society is never going to change, right? So we're always in this kind of um, dilemma. Uh, what, what I would do and what I would say is, um, let's let's test we always can test right so i would encourage companies to to test it maybe customers may surprise us mm -hmm. and an example that what we're doing in our company um uh, we have created uh inclusivity guidelines for for our language teams which try to minimize this kind of stuff they don't tackle them all because it's very uh difficult in some cases but in other cases, it's uh, if you're mindful of that when translating, you may be able to to make it some mm. kind of uh, neutral. Mm. Yeah, but it's a struggle if what you're looking for is is naturalness for sure. Mm. So I, I feel you, Lexan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give one minute for 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 one person else to con to 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 add something. If you guys wanna add something, because add Patrick Chu, please give sure. us your point oh. of view. One minute. <laughs> sure. uh, <laughs> Hopefully I can say this quickly. Uh, Change.org at least has our start from our source uh, copy, a very, very sort of gender equity uh, viewpoint. And so it usually makes it easier to move forward. However, in languages that we do support that are that do have grammatical gender, such as French, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and Russian, um, you know, it has kind of been sort of a toss up as to how far to go with each market or each territory, I should say. Um, pretty much everybody has thought about gender inclusivity in how we do our translations. Uh, a lot of times uh, we've had to consider not only just what the copy is, but also real estate on the web page or on the on display. So I would definitely say that, say for instance, like Russian, where everything is much <clears throat> longer, if you are going to potentially even include both forms, masculine, feminine, and or use slashes. Typographically, it looks horrible in Russian, and it just becomes too bloated. Uh, for languages like French and Spanish and German and Portuguese and Italian, usually we can get away with other typographical stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody had mm -hmm. mentioned in the chat about German having these requisite, prerequisites legally to not have um, gendered bias. And we mm -hmm. have you know, definitely tried to include both and we do use a normative sort of like a uh, typographical uh, representation. We have gotten negative feedback, feedback from some, but it's easier to get negative feedback than positive feedback. And we hear usually that it's a minority out of all the users. Mm -hmm. uh, we've kind of decided to stick to our guns, at least in Germany, where we say, hey, you know, this is a debate within the country, but because of who we want to present ourselves as, mm -hmm. which is as impartial as, you know, inclusive as possible, we're going to stick to our guns and actually use those. Um, <laughs> one of the initial sort of pushbacks from our Brazilian team was that, you know, in using, say, the ampersand sign, the one of the OG sort of like uh, romance language uh, workarounds, was that it would make text to speech accessibility less accessible, which at the time, you know, at face value was very true. Um, however, I started to think to myself, I'm like, well, we're a campaigning, you know, sort of organization. Why don't we campaign, you know, Texas speech enterprises to actually accommodate hmm. uh, gender inclusive language? But that's not the case anymore. So we've even Team Brazil has sort of like made a pivot uh, hmm. where we actually are now considering being able to represent in a much more gender equitive manner. So that's where we're at. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Lexan. Yeah, thank you, you so like much. It? Thanks for the intervention. Yeah. I like it so With much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, thanks to you. So now I, I would like to introduce our next guest speaker, which is another of my good friends, is Mr. Damian, who is just me, he's Spanish, he's from Galicia, so Gallegos, hermanos, y Asturianos, primos hermanos, right? So Yes. Almost like family. Hi, Javi. Hi, <laughs> hi everyone. My my name is Damian. I I work in Booking.com, so I'm a colleague of Emma actually, but I'm based in Amsterdam. Hey, Emma. Uh, 
Yeah, I've been working in booking for five years now, also like in the in the language uh, department, uh, and I'm a he him gay man. And yeah, I have a question that I would like to ask to, to the panelists, and, and it's more from, from a practical perspective, uh, because we have been hearing like super interesting stories from, from the panelists about their own experiences, but I would also like to know uh, regarding empathy as an LGBTQ plus person myself, how any tips that you would have about how can I make life better for my LGBTQ plus co-workers. Patrick Nunes, would you like to give us your point of view? Sure, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I think um, bringing that up is that, is that first step, right? So thank you, for, thank you for that. Um, and I think it, there, there are a few aspects of that. I think one is that self-check, right? Checking your bias, being aware of it. We're, we're talking more and more about this. There's a, there are a lot of resources out there that can help us guide how we check in with our own bias. And uh, what's the cultural approach? Again, I mentioned like being from Brazil, you know, I grew up in an environment where joking about differences was accepted, right? It was, was, was normal. And, and now more and more we're, we're, we're having to face our, our own cultural approaches to things to, to say, well, that's actually, that's not okay to joke about that. It's not an okay joke, right? Um, and, and I think one, one of the important things to, to note is that as, as if, you're, if you're outside of the, of the LGBTQIA plus community, um, realize that you're, you're not going to get it right all the time, and that's okay. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's very important to, to acknowledge that. And I think when in doubt, ask. You know, is that, you know, treat others how they want to be treated. I think that's important. Um, and, and if you get it wrong by accident, um, apologize. It's okay, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the, the environment that we have. And I think the, fl the flip side of that, which I think is also very important, and, and, and I know there are, there are many who are with us today that are part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And I think that we can't forget that, right? We also have our own biases within our own community, as was mentioned before. And I think in terms of, of, of empathy, as you mentioned, I think that goes a long way with those who are not part of the community. Because nowadays, I, because of the, the, the environment that we live in, I also see a lot of members of the LGBTQIA plus commu community being very, being very short patient with, with the others and, and mm -hmm. kind of the, the, this culture of cancellation, right? If you don't get it right, I'm just going to shut you out instead of using that opportunity to educate people. So I think mm -hmm. it's, it's going one step further. I think empathy is great, but actually compassion goes much further, right? It's like, how can I make it easier for this person who's trying to learn the environment? And I mentioned this in our in our conversation previously, of course, there are those assholes where like, you know, the bigotry is right there and they, and they are, you know, they come out of their way to make your, your the life of, of minorities or differences hell. Um, and, and if you're part of, 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 if you're watching us right now, great. I'm glad you're here so you can maybe learn something, but I'm sure in our community, uh, most of us are, are here because we, we have that, that inclination to, to understand it better. So I think for the, the, those who are not part of the community, um, learn, try to understand as much as you can ask when you when in doubt and for us who are part of that community let's be empathetic and be compassionate about those to to educate and because that's the only way we can move forward mm -hmm. thank you man you you i love your opinions they're super cool always <laughs> terence would you like to give us yours now sure definitely and i think patrick uh, put a lot out i'm gonna there. i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you one and a half minutes in the interest of time because okay. it's approaching the hour <laughs> i'll go fast have, i'll go fast oh, no it's fine no worries but we have we still have two more two more interesting questions that are going to be asked by all the two guest panelists so <laughs> certainly but why don't i just first say what this is a great question because uh, one of the top words we're using a lot at starbucks right now is the word allyship uh, how are we uh, going out there and thinking about those around us, whether it's those of us in our offices or those of us outside the offices, mm -hmm. how are we reaching out to them? And when I think of allyship for our coworkers who are, who are in the LGBTQIA plus family, um, you know, it come, comes down to two different areas. One is at that kind of corporate level. Uh, so what are you doing to foster a positive culture that is accepting? I mean, if you're seeing things that aren't right, put yourself in the shoes of someone who is in, who does identify as queer, um, that, um, you know, like, what would make them feel uncomfortable? How do you not be a passive bystander? How do you actively speak up? 
whether that's, and how do you feel comfortable speaking of? Um, and then on a personal level, uh, just reaching out to, um, and recognizing that we talked earlier about the comfortability of uh, being um, uh, open with your private life. When someone is open with their private life to you, uh, how do you acknowledge that in a way that isn't off-putting? Uh, how do you actually just, you know, accept that, hey, they're opening with their life. How do you open up with your life? How do you support them if they want to do life? Mm -hmm. It's really coming up to like thinking about a bit more actively how you're providing that supportive environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Damian. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. So, guys, how are you finding it? All good? We have two more questions, and now I probably have one from the audience. Uh, all good, guys? Everyone feeling good? Comfortable? We still have another 15, 20 minutes. Let's, let's use another 15 minutes, okay? Everyone has another 15 minutes. So I want to invite another good friend of mine, William Spalding. How are you, man? Would you like to introduce yourself? Turn your, turn your camera on and introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is William. Uh, I use he, they pronouns. I identify as demigendered. So very excited to see just this panel and everybody have discussing these topics, particularly when it comes to gender equity. That's an important subject to me, so thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, just as community members, what are some ways that, and this piggybacks off of the previous question quite well, what are some ways that you're actioning that allyship to other marginalized members of our community? Um, are there direct actions or practices you're taking in your day-to-day, -day, whether it's in your professional network or in your local queer community network um, that is standing for and, and lifting up marginalized groups? Fab uh, Fabi, would you like to comment on that one? Sure. Thank Do you, you mean marginalized groups within the community or also yeah. outside of the community? Within the community. Okay. Uh, yes, I think this is, these are initiatives that you could do, like uh, the Equity and Diversity Committee that we implemented, that we created at the campus. This is one, one opportunity to do that. I, I personally try to embrace, you know, being a gay man and having, knowing, and coming from Brazil, a country where, you know, prejudice is rampant. Um, and it's become very conservative, it's going backwards. I try to be as embracing of other uh, groups as possible, trying to, as Patrick said, trying to tame my unconscious bias every time, all the time. Um, how, what can we do? I think, you know, first, um, I think the main problem is if you if you don't know who you're talking to, who you know whether this person is a marginalized person or not, it's difficult for you to detect and and to do something about it. If, for instance, when as as I said, when we did the rehearsal uh, session here, uh, we just assume that people are cisgender. You you don't you know not it's not easy to tell whether it's cis, whether you're cis or trans. You said you don't identify as cis, for instance, I could never tell. So how, the, the question is, how do we detect these people uh, before so that we can help them? Of course, if they will come to me, I will do my best to help them. But if I don't know where they are and who they are, it's very hard for us to, to do something about it. Of course, you know, you see people, marginalized people, especially in my country where uh, the economic situation is, is going bad. So you know that there are people out there in the streets that need help, but this is not exactly, you know, they're not exactly people prepared for some, some of the work that we, that we provide here. So I don't know, I think it's time that we, uh, as I said, I think we need to know who are our people, where are these people are and, and, you know, have a better understanding of how many we are and where we are located and how we can help them. Uh, but for sure, I, I think, you know, uh, associations or groups of, of support groups would be, would be paramount for, for that. And I don't know of any in this industry. So there's definitely something that we could do about it. Avi, thank you. And William, thank you, man. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Cheers, man. And uh, so now I have, a, I have a one last question that I want to ask you from the last of our guest panelists. The last part, I don't think this guy needs introduction. He's a, a, an industry legend. He's my, I call him my number one mentor here. And, and I want to be like him when I grow old. 
and I'm on the way. Renato. <laughs> Thank you, Javi. <laughs> Uh, I, I must have been doing something wrong because every time I, somebody needs to introduce me, they say that I don't need introduction. So, well, I'm here uh, on a vacation, enjoying very much this panel. Uh, I always learn from uh, exposure and um, experiences. Uh, I'm a recovering bigot. I'm a male, he, he, him, me, whatever. Uh, and uh, I might play with it as a dismissive thing, but uh, uh, I have been, I say that I'm recovering because I, I, I was a bigot. I come from Brazil. Uh, I, uh, I remember having discussions internally at uh, my company with my ex-wife about hiring Fabiano. And the reason why I gave Fabiano his job in the industry was because he had a website. He was the first person in the world that I met that had a GeoCities website where he published poetry. And that was way more important and way more cool than anything else. Uh, in any case, my question is this. Over, over the years, and especially five years ago, um, we all engaged into this transformation uh, of uh, supporting gay marriage. And that became a movement that transformed the world. It was a, a very good example of where the United States taking the, taking the leadership changed what happened like a domino effect all over the world. Many other countries did that before. But the question that I have is that, uh, and even though I understand that we're, we're, there are still issues in the LGBTQIA plus, uh, community that need to be addressed as we've discussed all day today. What causes should we all embrace now? Uh, the same way that uh, you were able to engage uh, uh, people to defend the marriage equality and the, the non-discrimination efforts. What are what is the next step? What, what, where do we go from here? What other causes uh, should we focus on? And, and Patrick Chu, would you like to reply to this question? Sure. I think uh, my thoughts at least on that are that the work one is still not completely done, uh, even though, you know, movement forward with gay marriage has made progress around the world, hasn't really 100% done so. Um, I think for me at least, the comments that some of the other panelists have brought up, which is looking at the spectrum of issues that do exist or where people fall, um, being able to uplift the most marginalized and sort of like, how to say it, precarious positioned folk, to me is actually going to be probably the, the cause to sort of like rally behind because if it really is going to be a rising tide lifts all boats, you know, starting off with those who are the least uh, empowered is going to be probably the best way to make sure that everybody else gets uplifted as well. Hmm. Hmm. Mr. Nunes, would you like to also give your point of view? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Patrick on that. There, there's a lot that still needs to be done. And personally, uh, for me, I, I'm taking a, a look. And, and again, I'm somewhat of a convert as well in terms of my own bias, to be honest, within our own community. I was one of those people who every time a ladder was added to the, to the you know, LGBT, I, I would react like, why? Why do we have another one? It's so confusing. That was my thought many years ago. And, and I, I had to overcome that and learn, again, my, my own bias. Why, why is it so important to have that representation, right? And knowing that, uh, I'm trying to learn more about within that community, what else I can do. Um, I, I live in a, a, a privileged neighborhood in Chicago and, and uh, as the, the Black Lives Matter movement really ignited again a, a few months ago, um, there was a mural that was painted one street over from me here uh, about Black Trans Lives Matter. And, and actually that triggered me, like that's actually one portion, I think Emma put that very well in that spectrum of where we all fall. So personally, that's one thing that I'm, I'm curious about and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about and how I can be supportive, but there's so many causes out there, right? I don't think there is a matter of bigger or smaller cause. We, we're, we're in a society where in a lot of places, mm -hmm. things are still backwards. In a lot of places we're moving backwards and, um, and we have to be aware of that. And I think there's, there's opportunity for everybody to be involved in, in so many regards today. Mm -hmm. uh, Fabi, since here's your first boss ever. 
I think I think representation, uh, not only outside of the community, but also within the community. You see here, we were four gay, white, male, cis people. Uh, we were not fully represented, and there's still a lot of prejudice against, you know, transgender, also within within the letters. So a a a a masculine gay male is usually feels more empowered or feels better than a more effeminate one. Uh, drag queens are not, you know, given the same chances. And, you know, even I, I have an employee who identifies as queer because she said that she, she would be bisexual because she, you know, she has the, the, the both preferences, but by identifying as bisexual, it can feel like she's just another girl trying to hook up with guys, kissing another girl. So bisexual, now it's not only seen as a bad term, not only from outside of the community, but within the community because it has this, this strange approach to it. So mm -hmm. it's very hard to, to, to find a balance between, and, and it's hard to keep up as well. I'm 49 years old and I'm having, <laughs> I sometimes have a hard time as, as Patrick was saying, so why all the letters? Because the letters are important. The more letters, the better. So we need diversity as well. So I think the next causes will be diversity and representation, finding a good mm -hmm. uh, level of both of them, which is, mm -hmm. which is important. Now. And uh, thank you. I like to, I like, we are running out of time, but I like to have the opinion of Terence and Emma and, mm -hmm. and audience. I'm sorry, we will not be able to answer any of, any of your QA questions. I'm sorry about that. But, I think you're finding this panel interesting. Like, just from since the moment we started until now, there's almost the same people connected. So, I'd love to have your opinion, Terence, and then Emma. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think um, some of this has already been covered already. But for me, the top cause that I'm worried about is trans is transgender um, rights um, and healthcare. Um, Patrick Nunes mentioned um, earlier that we are some in some cases taking some steps back. And unfortunately, when it comes to transgender rights, we've taken uh, some really horrifying steps back, especially in terms of um, access to healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, particularly to me, um, is worrisome. Um, and I also begin to worry about what other potential steps back. We've made a lot of progress, um, and how do we maintain that uh, without going backwards? Um, and then I also am, uh, another big cause is just really, we talked earlier around um, intersectionality and thinking about the uh, people of color in the LGBTQIA plus community, um, especially, um, and, and it was mentioned already, uh, uh, with uh, hearing about black trans lives matter. Um, this is um, oftentimes um, in ignored groups. Um, how do we give them visibility? How do we listen mm -hmm. to them and how do we advocate for them? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Emma, you're closing the, the day today. <laughs> yeah, what an honor. Uh, yeah, I would just like to add that sometimes we think that just because there are laws out there, the, then it's the solution is already there. And uh, this is not the case. And uh, if you're not a member of the, of the community, you may think that just because now in many countries we can get married and we have laws against homophobia, it's, it's a done deal, that's it, right? And first of all, this is not the case in all countries. Sometimes we, like we say, okay, the United States passed this law, then we assume that it's the same in many countries. It's not like that. There's people still being killed for being gay in some countries in the world. And, and then, um, well, uh, I still, if I'm walking around in Barcelona, cosmopolitan city, 21st century, I'm walking with my girlfriend holding hands and I still get looks, I still get comments from people. And if you're not part of the community, you, you, you would not see that at all. So I think that as long as this is not absolutely normalized within society, it's it's embraced by culture and it's uh, like embedded in our in in our culture from the beginning we still have reasons to to fight for so that's yeah that's what i what i believe well thank you thank you emma thank you all of you guys uh, so uh, i, I want to thank everybody again like uh, uh, for me this is this has been like one of the 
coolest days, one of the coolest things that I've done since I started in this industry. I cannot but thank you all of you guys, the audience that has been here. It's, it's amazing. Like everyone has been here almost from the beginning to now. I am so thankful for that. All of you guys, Isban, Aaron, Will, Ramian, Lexan, all the team that has been doing this. Thank you for putting this effort. I hope, I hope we, 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 we can do something like this again. Uh, because there's so much things that we haven't really touched upon, right? Uh, so as, as we're sharing here, you will receive an email with uh, today's recording. And, uh, and the, the next session we have, uh, it's, it's also pretty cool. We're going to be talking about, we have almost uh, put it together, but we're going to be talking about career development in an industry like ours in which uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's, very, it's, very, it's very, very funny, call it that way, right? Because many of us, do not come from a translation background and, and we're all here. One in, in the vendor side, on the, on the buyer side, in sales, in, pro, in product, in engineering, uh, but, do, do, but in the translation industry, right? So we're gonna be talking about career development. The registration will soon be open and, and, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. I hope everyone had a great time. Sending Bye. all my love to everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank all you, you stay good, guys. Thank you, Aparo. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.